Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for joining the next in our webinar series. Today's session is about future proofing your home on a budget or home retrofits. And we've got a fantastic session today, which will be led by local resident Jurgen from Old Oak, who's done some amazing upgrades and improvements to his home. So he'll be telling you his story and how he's taken some of those works and doing those on a budget or for, for a good cost. As usual, uh, please do be polite and respectful of others. I will make sure that everyone is on mute so that there's no background noise or interference. But please do use the chat throughout for Q&A. So we hope to have about 15 minutes at the end or, or 20 minutes to make sure that we've got plenty of time to go through any questions that you have. So please feel free to make comments and questions throughout. If we don't have the right colleagues on the call to answer those questions, we will take those questions away and get back to you afterwards as usual. And this session is being recorded and we will follow up afterwards with the slides and the recording. So any links that we share or any references we make, you will have access to afterwards as well. Uh, we will hear from Hanesh Mehta, who is Head of Climate Change at h &F Council, who will give us a bit of an introduction to buildings and net zero, and then hand over to Jürgen, who's a local Hammersmith and Fulham resident living in Old Oak, who will tell us his story. And then we will get on to the Q&A. Okay, so I think at this point I will hand over to Hanesh to give us a bit of introduction into why future-proof our buildings. Thanks, Emily, and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yes, good. Um, hi everyone, I'm Hanesh Mehta, I'm the Head of Climate and Ecology at Hamilton and Fulham Council. Um, seems strange to me presenting on uh, some of these issues on a day like today. But uh, and if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. Well, this, this one is uh, probably the most relevant for, for today, given that the UK's temperature record has just been broken. Uh, so if you haven't seen that already, about 10 minutes ago, it uh, was broken in an area of Surrey. So as you can see from the uh, warming stripes, as they're known, this uh, well, the, the the last decade has been the warmest on record, um, and this is likely to persist. And this uh, is, this is a, a long-term climate change trend. And the warmest six years have all been the warmest six years have all been since 2015, um, with 2020 being uh, and, and 20. 16, 2019, 2020, all being in the top three of all time. So, yeah. Um, next slide, please, Emily. Um, the biggest contributor to climate change, uh, particularly in H&F, is buildings. We're a very dense urban environment and our buildings are the main source of that. 75% uh, of our carbon emissions in the borough come from buildings. Uh, next slide, please, Emily. Um, main sources of our building emissions come from heating our homes, offices and other buildings, uh, particularly from gas boilers, which uh, are, are used in most buildings in the UK. Uh, they also contribute to air pollution. Emissions also come from powering buildings through the electricity made by burning fossil fuels. So although the grid is being decarbonised all the time, uh, about 50% of it is still made by burning fossil fuels. Um, and emissions also come from poorly insulated and leaky buildings, which require more energy to heat and power. Next slide, please, Emily. Uh, so the solution is really to upgrade buildings to make them more uh, energy efficient and powered by green energies. And this is known as retrofit measures. So it's a term you'll hear often from us in the media, from government and others. Um, next slide, please, Emily. Retrofit measures include some of these, uh, including external or internal wall insulation, insulation in your loft or floors uh, or in your cavity walls. Um, and then changing your uh, heat sources to uh, either heat pumps or solar solar panels. 
um, things like double glazing and draft proof draft proofing also really important to retro uh, to, to, to do in your homes as well as well as low energy lighting um thanks emily um, on a budget so uh, we uh, have uh, various schemes um, that we support or that we uh, can direct you to. Um, many of these are listed on our website, but they include the boiler upgrade scheme, uh, which will help you replace your gas boiler with a heat pump. The uh, Green Homes Grant, um, which um, will help low income households living in energy inefficient properties to upgrade their homes. And that's uh, available for homeowners or landlord landlords. There is the Energy Company Obligation Scheme, um, which uh, very similar to the Green Homes Grant, but it's uh, funded by energy companies. And we also subsidize home retrofit plans. So we have a home retrofit plan subsidy at the moment for those who aren't eligible for grant funding. So you can find out what you can do to your home. Next slide, please. And um, with planning, most retrofit measures don't actually require planning permissions that's important to, to know and, and Roy he's here on the call from our planning team can answer any questions you might have about planning later on. Um, we have uh, a web, web page uh, which is shown here climate change and planning which gives you a comprehensive guide to all of the planning requirements or uh, planning guidance that might be needed for any retrofit measures you might do on your home. And we also offer free pre-planning advice for retrofit measures. So you can call or email our planning department and we can give you free advice before you make a planning application. So you know what you're in for if you are undertaking retrofit measures. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Hinesh, for that brief introduction. I think my colleague has just put some links in the chat to those planning pages. Um, as well as the free duty planner advice for retrofit works as well. So you can find out more about that. But now delighted to introduce Jürgen, a local resident in Hammersmith and Fulham and a super homeowner who's going to be telling us a bit of a case study about his home and telling his story. Jürgen. Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Is that all right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, now I'm going to try to take over your screen. Let me see if I can. Uh, one and... Oh, twice. Okay. Yeah. So um, just that's my home here um, in East Acton. And I just want to explain a few things here. Uh, and I basically start with um, something about embodied energy and lots of these questions, which I'm going to try to answer here are questions which constantly get posed to me when I had open home. So part of the London open home weekend, normally in September, I open my home quite a few times, also as part of the Super Homes Network. So if you can, if you uh, uh, search the internet for Super Homes Network, that's where a member of and many others, highly energy efficient uh, houses are there listed. And you can actually visit some of them nearby or at least ask questions if they relate to what you like to ask. Now, many of these questions which I have um, when people visit me is the cost, how much did that system cost. So my system cost in 2012, 12,000 pounds. Yeah, that seems a lot of money. But at the time we had a feed in tariff and that was basically an incentive to actually start a, a green revolution, so to say, because PV solar by that time was already a very mature technology. PV solar is an extremely mature te technology. It's been done all over the world for, for literally for decades. And uh, it goes back to the 1920s, 30s, basically. That's how long it has been around, but really available to anybody since the 70s and 80s when you buy a, a, a solar powered calculator or solar powered watch. That's how it sort of, aha, uh -huh, there's something there. And then the first industrial scale industry, so to say, which really produced on industrial scale PV solar panels, photovoltaic solar panels, happened some 25 years ago, really, in, in Asia and in Germany. And there were dozens of companies some 25 years ago in Germany, not one company in China, just by comparison. And today, literally all companies produce in China, and there are only very few on the continent. So going back to the cost, they're very extremely expensive. But retrofitting PV solar system 
on old housing stock was a big issue. And a lot of people were very worried uh, that that could not actually take off, hence the insensitive for feed in tariff. Now, it's gone very mature here in England. You have lots of different companies. So if you really consider getting a PV solar system installed, you can look on the internet, you can phone up to your local council. There are so many planning portals and information available. It's really quite easy. And of course, you have to get companies in to give you a quote and you have to see if that's fit or talk to friends, family or people you trust to actually see how did it work. Uh, today, that system wouldn't cost me even £5,000. The same system. So what you're having here is 20 square meters and I'm facing southeast. So southeast basically means I get only 82% of what would be normally 100% uh, radiance from the sun. 100% would be facing south. I'm facing southeast, so I get more morning sun, but less evening sun. Hence, I get only 82% of that 100%. So you have to be clear about that. Facing east and south and west is now a real option for PV solar. And particularly in Germany, they tried for many years. They actually put incentives out for east and west facing solar systems. So you don't have this enormous day peak, uh, daytime peak. So uh, these systems are now very cheap. Another question which come very often, and it's basically electricity cost has gone up basically. A, a kilowatt hour costs you now be anything between 30 to 50 pence in a way. Uh, you'll pay standing charge as well. So now basically it's a time to invest in PV solar. You produce your own electricity, your own energy, and then it's up to you how you make most of this energy you harvest. Most of that energy you can harvest in your, on your own roof. Now, there are other systems you can put on balconies, et cetera, but I won't go into that one. But there are many other alternative uh, systems which you can entertain if you don't want to go for the big job. But also, if you have a garage, an outbuilding, which has a, a proper, which is properly connected to your main electricity, you can also have PV solar system installed there. So friends or family, they just had one installed on their double garage. So if you don't want to install it on the house, or it's not really an option, consider something like that. Just think outside the box and then you have planning people like Roy who can give you advice if that is possible, allowed or not. So that is, I can't comment on that. Now, back to my PV, back to the question it's often asked, how long will a PV solar panel last? And I'm gonna say, well, they last indefinitely. Uh, the thing is, they're going to produce less and less energy as time goes on. They are guaranteed as an international standard that they guarantee you 85% uh, of their original rating after 25 years. So if you have a 100 watt panel, if you buy a 100 watt panel in the shop, that will still use 85 watt of electricity in 25 years time. So the reason why big solar farms actually change their solar panels because they are more efficient one on the market right now. So you're not actually changing them because they're broken or they don't produce electricity. They're simply better ones on the market for less money. So on my home, for example, these panels uh, produce 3.34 kilowatt hour peak. That's basically the whole system. That's 20 square meters. That is what they produce on a peak day. Now it just happened to be that on that peak day, you will have, uh, over the course of a year, about 3,000 kilowatt hours you produce. And that is pretty much enough for me and my family to actually live carbon neutral in East London. Uh, in, sorry, in West London, East Acton, sorry. So uh, just to be clear, so I produce with these panels about 3,000 kilowatt hours, and that is pretty much as exactly what we use as a family of four. And I'm going to show you more figures in a, in a second. I also got a battery bank. Here, the battery bank is, uh, I would not, not necessarily recommend that system, but just to be absolutely clear, uh, battery is very, very good to have one if you want to maximize your return on your investment, but they're still quite pricey. So just be a bear that in mind. It's a moment I would still go just for a PV system. And then that gives you enough electricity and you can really help to, you know, save the planet, so to say, and save money. So. Uh, economical as well as uh, ecological sustainability is not a contradiction. It's literally you buy them off the shelf. Another question I get often asked, and I want to go back on that, is um, how long does it take to recuperate the, your investment? How long does it take till you get your money worth back? And again, that's a myth, because if you ask the same question, how long does it take your gas boiler till you get your money back? 
uh, you don't ask that question. How long does it take to put TV to recuperate that cost or your car? So you really have to be clear. When you think critically, then you have to apply the same critical thinking of everything you do. So also the embodied energy comes often up. Now, if you have a PV panel which faces south or southeast or west, you definitely get your money and that embodied energy back. Bear in mind your uh, gas boiler or heat source pump or radiators or copper piping all have embodied energy. So just apply this to everything. So what you're going to find if you look at these things, actually PVs are last fantastic and it produces, for example, today enough electricity to cool my house. So it's actually comfort as well. So I just try to get the screen again. Hold on. Yeah, that's basically a graph. That's basically an Excel spreadsheet you see here, where you basically see my energy generated at the top left corner, January, very little energy I generate in the in per month, that's basically monthly. And you look at the energy I import. So I import a lot of energy during January. It was like my screen has just gone back. Oops, there's a bit of jumping going on here. Um, so you just see that the energy imported, energy generated. When you look at the summer, if you look at July, energy imported is very little, only maybe 100, maybe 76, 72, 60s um, uh, kilowatt hours per month I import and I produce or export 380, 456 and so on and so forth. So what it is in the summer, I produce far too much electricity uh, in the winter far too little. So it's very clear uh, how it works. So that's why the grid is important. The electricity I don't need is in the summer exported and it could someone else's house if they have a heat pump, for example. So it's just, um, that's what it is. But over the course of a year, pretty much what I use is uh, what I produce. Uh, another thing here, it's insulation, obviously, is the energy we don't need to produce in any sort of form. It's the best energy. So we have a huge potential for saving. And so insulation is the key. If you don't want to sit in the cold, don't want to be in the heat in the summer, so insulate your house, yeah. Now, obviously, if I would give this presentation in Germany, they have insulation, which is 100 millimeters, box standard. It's normally, it's, it's 30 centimeters. If you just one foot, I try to show this on my computer screen, yeah. It's about one foot of insulation on house is quite common. Now, if you try to retrofit, that's impossible in, in London. And I don't think there's a need for it because you don't have quite the extreme climatic condition to, that you find somewhere in Germany. So I got here insulation and what I've done here, and I don't know if you can see all my mouse here, but there's basically insulation boards on the floor and I have an electric underfloor heating. And then I put my memorium, linoleum floor on top of that. And that is basically memorium click is a system which I use, but there are many other systems. It's just like engineered board. And that's basically goes on top of the electric underflow heating. And that goes in addition to with my air to air source heat pump. So electric underflow heating is very expensive. Just be totally clear about it. It's very easy to install. It's unkaputbar, but it is very expensive to run because literally one kilowatt of electricity you put in there gives you one kilowatt of heat. If you have a heat pump, you barely put 250 watts in and you get one kilowatt of heat. And again, I'm going to explain that in a little while. So here again, you see me insulating the house. That's one of the first things I did. There was no insulation whatsoever. It's a 1920s mid terrace house. So that's what you probably find. And I didn't go overboard with insulation. I put 100 millimeter rock wool, maybe a bit more, wherever I could fit it because you can't compress it too much either. So it has to be sensibly done. Um, you have, for example, these lining papers you can see here, which are fantastic. Uh, these lining, insulation lining paper, I barely put that in. I put in a cost, I just sent the screenshot, which I did a few days ago. So you can see they don't cost the world, they really don't cost much money. And they uh, are doing a little bit, you can see the equivalent of what it is. You can see another graph here on the right hand side. Once the PowerPoint is online, you can always go back and have a look again. But just want to show you that this insulation paper on the inside of your house will make already a huge difference on the whole wall space, which you have then insulated. On the outdoor walls, it's gonna make a considerable difference. So just be, be aware. Obviously a proper uh, cavity wall insulation and external wall insulation would be much better. No question about it. But what I'm trying to do here, every little helps. And in my home, that helped me a great deal. And that has been around for over 40 years. My parents use it. It's not a problem. Um, just again, I have to get the screen. Yeah, here you see my 
air-to-air -air source heat pump. So it's an air conditioning unit, if you want to call it, but it's an air-to-air -air source. So that's a very cheap way. Again, if you look at my mouse, you can see here, my outdoor unit is here. My indoor unit is this very smart unit here. That's what I call the blower. That's what you normally, that's either I'm cooling or heating uh, my conservatory, which then obviously heats the whole downstairs. So uh, it's, I have very uh, good insulated um, double glazing. I don't, I didn't go for triple glazing. It would be too expensive. I think it's always, I have to look at value for money. It's low E double glazing, argon filled. So it's very good. And that's the unit here. The unit in my workshop, you may even see it on my screen right now is actually this one here. It's been here now for some uh, 15 years and it's been doing its job ever since. And the cost has declined tremendously. And again, I want to show you this on this sort of, again, on the internet, you look on the internet for air to air source, heat pump, air conditioning, whatever way you want to Google it. And you find these user, these units have dropped in price tremendously. So that's, a, that's what you call a DIY unit. However, I would never recommend to do a DIY. You need to have a proper qualified a uh, gas engineer or whatever a plumber who can do that fit that but the unit is basically 600 pounds so it's it's a bargain so if you have that installed by a professional company you're looking maybe at 2000 pounds to actually get your uh, house much quicker heated and much quicker cooled now you haven't done anything to save the planet yet or save our habitat but you made your home much more comfortable and now the next step is PV solar, because then the PV solar will supply the electricity for your air-to-air -air source heat pump. Here you get different system. This one is, is 750 pounds. You don't have an outdoor unit at all. You just need two holes through your brick wall, and this unit sits on the inside. Again, it, they're called through the wall air conditioning system, and they're very popular. They're noisier and that are not as energy efficient. They only have a ratio of about one to three, meaning I need 330 watts to get one kilowatt of heat out of it or cooling power. There is one I showed you earlier with an outside unit, condenser unit, is a ratio is one to four. So 250 watt give you one kilowatt of heat or cooling power. These are even more compact. That's like a compact, uh, air conditioning system you can just barely hold and and you barely just uh, can wheel anywhere it comes on wheels that is barely what was only a few years ago a box standard air conditioning unit however these box standard air conditioning unit for just 370 pounds they're actually now heat pumps i.e they actually heat your home as well in the winter as they cool in the summer so, and it's fantastic because in, in better like that, you may want to build that out and then you can use it in the winter to supplement your old gas system. Yeah. So yes, of course you want to get rid of gas. There's no question about that. You want to get pure electric, but there's a way, take it slowly. And this is never wasted and you can always sell it on again. You have air to water heat pump system, again, very energy efficient rather than heating your water with gas or electrically, you've got the heat pump, which is actually on your boiler, it's fixed in the boiler, it's one system, all you need is your plumber to take your old boiler out and put that one in. Again, that is just a two week old price, 2000 pounds, and that is done and you need obviously the plumber to do it for you. But just to give you, these costs can be broken down and you may want to start slowly. There is in Germany, again, and in, in Scandinavia, sorry, I'm very continental here, there are a lot of uh, uh, heat pump powered air dryers, uh, dry dryers, uh, washing dryers, but also heat pump powered washing machine dryer combination. As you can see, this uh, Bosch one here, this is one of the AAG. I'm not doing any advertising with any company, but I'm saying they are out there. There are many other companies which do them now. And basically they're highly energy efficient. So when you use these as a washing machine, they cost much more. But if you think how much your electricity is at the moment, and it's gonna go only one way, it's gonna go up till it falls down, if we're lucky, but it's only gonna go up. So these are a very worth investment. And just replacing your washing machine, dishwasher uh, and tumble dryer with something which has a heat pump is much better. Here you've got a twin cover, so cavity wall cooking uh, material. It's only one company in the world which produces them, so it's in Swiss made. They're very nice. And actually like you can heat and cook very energy efficient. So you cook with an induction cooker, extremely energy efficient. So just to give you an idea, 
induction, here we got LED light. LED light, if people would have told you that a few years back, they would have just laughed at you. So LED light have very little embodied energy. They're very easy to be recycled. And these, these have uh, basically use only 10% uh, of the energy goes into heat and 90% 90 goes into really good light. Whereas if you go back to the old incandescent light bulb, it was 90% heat and 10% light. So it's completely flipped. And that is a greater thing nowadays. That's where I get quite a bit of optimism, despite all of that, what goes on, because you can buy that. You can go into the shop and you can buy these things. They're much more energy efficient than they've ever been. And that gives us the option and the power to really change things. And that's why I'm quite optimistic. Here, what you see here, again, it's voltage optimizer. It's called, I put it in my home, or also an isolation transformer, as it's called again. Uh, it saves you energy because it actually optimizes electricity, which comes from my grid. So because you have voltage fluctuation and Hertz fluctuation in your grid, that gets rid of it and you've got exactly 230 volt all the time. And that device is magic and it keeps your LED light really lasting for long because maybe some of you have noticed that your LED light is supposed to last a lifetime, pop every few years and they go, they break because they don't, like voltage fluctuation. No one tells you that, but I tell you that. So that's why you need to have a voltage optimizer to prolong the life of all your electronic goods. Um, here you get a film you can put on your window. It's called a low E window film. They come at very, very different names. So if you have got single glazing and the single glazing is after 1950s, you can buy that film, you can do it yourself. And it goes on the class and it barely takes away all the infrared light. So all the infrared spectra, again, when I look at my mouse here, all the spectra from 700 nanometer onwards get isolated. So you have actually have an energy efficient glazing. It turns your single glazing into double glazing without any cost. If you have nice glass, nice window glass, that is a real option. You cannot use it on double glazing. Your unit will break. So it's very clear. So again, ask for professional advice. You can Google a lot of these things, but I can tell you it's very easy to use in the heritage sector. It's fantastic. And it makes your uh, window uh, kind of uh, break in proof. Yeah. Uh, my home has been featured quite a few times, you know, in papers and so on. I show politicians around. I spoke to the climate change committee in parliament, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm trying to spread the gospel here everywhere. So it is possible. I've been there now for 10 years. Nothing has broken down. I'm still here around. And I live with a family of four, very, very energy efficient. And it's very easy to do. Just quickly, I want to run through these slides because I'm seeing I'm running out of time. Uh, I've got 25 minutes and I want to keep it to that. Uh, I started at 10 past, so I'm going to have another uh, three minutes. Um, so uh, just to show you that this graph shows you the CO CO2 concentration in the air. It's enormous, it has increased enormously. So uh, it's not anymore gossip that we do uh, make climate change. And obviously you realize that today, if you don't see it now, well, that's basically it. Um, saving energy has been around for some years. I love the headline here, this New Zealand Post, I believe Bailey was sent that, that is from 1912. I mean, you won't have the time now to read that because I'm gonna shoot the slide onto the next one, but you can always go back and that is Jimmy Carter. I mean, that is translated out what he says. Televised energy address in 1977, if we don't act quickly. Here, Margaret Thatcher, 1989, uh, Bailey talking about climate change. And she coined climate change. And all of a sudden, climate change, everyone talked about it. And uh, yeah, but we did very little about it. But that is just how it is. So, But now we have the option that we can change it. We can do something about it. Um, that is again, just to show you uh, how climate change affects millions of people as we speak, and obviously it affects us in the UK in particular today, but the other times when we have flood, too much rain, too much water, obviously it's always wetter, but the extremes have increased, there's no question about that. And here just, you know, refugees, the crisis, you know, everything you can connect to climate change, and you can really, you can really do that because there are millions of people suffering at the moment as we speak. So we mustn't wait for some Father Christmas matching warmth or something like that. We have to do that. We have to drive that. And we got the means to do it today because, you know, with any penny we have anywhere to spare to really put that in and really try to do it. Everyone can do their little bit, even if it's just changing light bulbs, 
if, if a little bit helps and we can do so. Uh, with nutrition is obviously another big, big aspect. I just want to tell you why we are in the situation we are here. So when you look at the biggest companies in the world, the biggest ones are uh, fossil fuel industries, as you can see that uh, here, very big one. So Walmart, for example, needs to employ some 2,200,000 people, so over 2 million people to show you, because it's the biggest company in the world, with the most employees, so to say, to make a profit of only 6.6 .6 uh, a billion a year, which is you know a lot or a little that's paying after everyone wages. Whereas when you go for the uh, uh, company in line number six here, they make with six with seventy six thousand employees, they make a profit of hundred and ten billion pound a year. Now that gives you an idea why we are where we are at the moment because energy density of fossil is tremendous. And that is why we are, what we have to do is actually take that load off and we have to really do energy democracy. More people get energy from their own home and it is possible we can do that quite easily. Uh, that is my grid GP. So that is, a, a, a you can actually track the power, con power production at the moment as we speak. Uh, you can actually go there and actually see how much power we produce. That is just a screenshot. You get Wind Europe. So you can actually keep an eye on these things, how these things develop. It's, it's, I find them really great. And there are pledges, lots of pledges to be carbon neutral uh, by 2030. Obviously, Hammersmith and Fulham Council is also one of them. There are many others. And it is possible we can be energy neutral by carbon 20 uh, or carbon, carbon neutral, sorry, carbon neutral by energy uh, by 2030 without any problems. And that's me. I think I'm three minutes over, two minutes. Yeah. No, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Jürgen, for, for keeping to time, which I very much appreciate. But also the incredible knowledge that you have from your experience and just really grateful for you, you know, after coming along to some of these webinars, getting in touch and, and saying that you had a story to share. So we really appreciate that. Thank you very much. We've now got about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. Um, so on, on the call, we've got Hanesh, uh, who's head of climate change. We've got Jürgen, um, who you've just heard from, and we've also got, uh, our colleague Roy from planning, if there's any questions about planning permission. Um, for the first question, I'm going to go to Hanesh, uh, which is a question about the extreme heat that we are experiencing. Is there anything that we can do to make it easier for homeowners to install external shutters or solar shading? So anything about making planning permission easier or a borrow-wide scheme in the same way that we have got solar together? Hanesh, can I just check that I can ask you to unmute there? Hanesh, I can see you, but I'm not sure if you're able to unmute. No? Okay. Sorry about the technical issues today, everyone. Um, Hanesh, maybe you can reply to that first question in, in the chat. Um, Jürgen, I might go to you for the second one, just in your experience. Um, are heat pumps difficult to get serviced or get parts for? Uh, no, they're, they're not. I mean, normally they have a very long lifespan. Um, and you don't have to have them serviced or, or maintained. Uh, you need to have to see clear as a filter. Anyone can do that. You do that yourself. Um, it's they're not a problem. And parts, you can get spare parts. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Thanks, Jürgen. Um, there's a question here about um, ventilation, uh, which says period homes in general need to go hand in hand uh, with retrofitting of insulation or draft proofing. Homes will suffer from poor air quality, condensation, and mold ventilation is, is almost always overlooked. I can see Jürgen nodding there. Um, Hanesh, I might ask you to comment in the chat in response to that. Um, but Jürgen, I don't know if there's anything you'd like to comment on there. Well, I can comment on anything. <laughs> no, um, yeah, I try to keep it as... as, as um, yeah, I, I totally agree with that statement. It's, it's a real problem. And if you have your house insulated, you still need to ventilate. And, and it gets me that people think uh, they're doing everywhere draft excluder. That is fine, but only to some degree. Then you have to vent your home. You have to literally open your window. It's the best way to do it, even if it's freezing cold. You open your windows for half an hour really exchange the air, close your window again, and carry on heating. So uh, uh, having obviously draft 
excluding is good, but it mustn't go to such a degree that you can't actually ventilate your home anymore. Mm -hmm. You have to be able, particularly on a hot summer's day or, in, or even on a cold winter's day, it's exactly the same. Thanks, Jürgen. I think we've got Hanesh now, which is great. Hanesh, I don't know if you'd like to comment on anything about our ways to make it easier for homeowners to install external shutters or solar shading, I mean, anything about ventilation as well. Yeah, thanks, Emily. Um, well, you, you've unmuted me for this question, but uh, the thing, the truth is we don't have an answer for it at the moment. We don't really have any way of making it easier to install external shutters or solar shading. It's really a kind of a... a yeah, a, a private initiative for people to do, but it's absolutely something we will be looking at for our upcoming council housing retrofit strategy. So those are the homes that we are directly responsible for um, and adapting them to uh, extreme heat and, and, and the increased frequency of heat waves is absolutely something we're going to look at. And hopefully the learnings from that can be shared across to private homes as well. Um, I would naturally pass over to, to Roy to comment on uh, making planning permission easier for external shutters and solar shading. I don't know if it's uh, very difficult at the moment to do to, to, to gain planning permission for that. I imagine in a conservation area, it might be a little bit more difficult, but maybe Roy, you can come in on that. Yeah, thank you, Hinesh. Uh, yeah, in short, uh, generally speaking, obviously we welcome and support retrofit uh, measures. Uh, if they have an external impact on the appearance of the building, that's where we might have concerns, and particularly if you're in a conservation area or you have a listed building, or if you have uh, a building that's had its permitted development rights removed uh, under Article 4. Uh, in those sorts of circumstances, you know, there's definitely you know, an application to be required and restraint. Uh, but more generally, you know, if you're looking at putting in shutters, it's really about the external impact and whether there's any material change in the appearance of the building. Because although you might be um, altering one individual property, if it's one part of a terrace, then it's about the impact on the character of the wider terrace as well to take into account. So it, it's almost like on a case by case basis, it depends what's being proposed. So if, if anybody is thinking about doing that, you know, we welcome the submission of any you know, draft uh, proposals to us through the pre-app service, which is free for residents. Uh, and then we can have a look at that and provide, you know, general advice on that. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Roy. Hanesh, I might come back to you for a transport related question now, uh, which is a question about battery storage. And could you potentially use an electric car as a two-way battery storage? I think you're, you should be unmuted, Hanesh. No? Let me try again. Uh, yeah, thanks. Yeah, sorry. It's uh, I, I, I keep muting myself because I'm in a, in, in a busy air conditioned environment at the moment. Um, so yeah, the question. Um, so so as far as I'm aware, yes, you can do that, and I have seen, I have seen um, it, it being done. So your car battery can be used to store a small amount of energy overnight, and uh, you know. If you have a two-way vehicle to grid uh, charging point, then then you can do that. Um, we are we have been looking into doing this. Uh, haven't done so so far as a council for our own fleet. We have um, some plans to do so in the near future when we start to bring in larger electric vehicles as they become available on the market. So yes, in short, you can do it. You obviously need to have the right infrastructure, the right charging points, and the ability to sell it back to the grid. Thanks, Hanesh. There was a question here about the free retrofit plans for homeowners who weren't eligible yep. for other kinds of grant funding, and I, I believe that's been answered in the chat. That that form was, we will alert you when it when it goes live. Um, so that's that's been slowed down a wee bit, but still absolutely uh, happening. So we can we can share the link for that sign up um, as well. A question back to you, Jürgen, uh, which was just a clarification about one of the slides. Did you say that a heat pump could directly replace a gas boiler without an external unit? Um, well, it, yes and no. It's basically if you have your heating system, which is basically running a lot of radiators through your property, you cannot just replace that gas boiler with a air to air source heat pump. You have to have an air to water source heat pump. And that would also require an outdoor unit. Yeah. 
So uh, uh, if you just replace the heating in one room, for example, or you have an open plan like I have in my home, then you barely this one air to air source heat pump heats my whole home, the whole ground floor. So I have electric underfloor heating, which takes the edge of things, and then the rest takes over with the air to air source heat pump in wintertime. Um, otherwise, but I also made, because that's all just a question, another question in the chat. A boiler can be replaced, i.e. your hot water cylinder, your hot water boiler cylinder, which just may you just run your hot water for showers, so to say, or for washing up your just your hot water system, that can be replaced directly with an air to water source heat pump. And that would literally go in the same space where you have your your um, boiler now, so to say, but that will not do your hot water for your radiators. It's very clear. So that's the water you use for bath, shower. Uh, sink, so to say, not the one for radiators. They're two different systems. Thanks, Jürgen. Um, just going through to the next question, Hanesh, um, you yeah. might just want to clarify a previous question, but will we have a group buying scheme for heat pump purchases in a similar way to Solar Together? Uh, yeah, that'd be really good. So Solar Together is run by the GLA on behalf of uh, London boroughs. So it's a really good London-wide scheme. Um, mostly successful. I know we've had some individual issues with installations of solar panels through the scheme, but hopefully, I know there has been some discussions at the GLA, hopefully at some point, I don't know when, uh, a, a similar group buying scheme for heat pumps will become available. I think there are lots of limitations uh, in the market at the moment on the supply of heat pumps, uh, many being redirected to other parts of Europe at the moment who are dealing with a gas crisis. Um, so yeah, there is uh, lots of issues to be resolved before a group buying scheme is available in London, but we will certainly be, uh, you know, the first ones in the queue if one is available to us as a council. Thanks, Hanesh. I'm gonna come back to you for the next one as well, which is about street trees. So saying street trees are obviously great to reduce heat too, but when things are planted and not watered, they're dying in the summer. And of course, in terms of heat wave like this, could we track and regularly water the young trees that we plant within the first two years? Yep, I mean, slightly moving away from the topic of today's uh, conversation. Uh, so I'd certainly um, encourage any of these questions to be asked at uh, the policy and accountability committee on climate and ecology next week so that's next tuesday we'll post a link to that if, if someone can do uh, but really short um, answer to that is yes i mean it's part of the grounds maintenance contract we have as a council and that is to keep our green spaces our parks uh, in particular watered um, there is a challenge obviously at the moment we've got a very dry uh, summer so far so you know not just us as a council but lots of other councils and other anyone that has a uh, green space is going to have this challenge lots of water needs to go into uh, maintaining uh, the trees and green spaces we have at the moment and that is one of the challenges with putting in more green spaces i can see i think from the question it's king street specifically that's been referred to obviously uh, watering spaces like green uh, spaces like King Street or High Streets is a challenge. Uh, planting more trees would be great. Um, uh, the main challenge in actually planting the trees in the first place on uh, streets like King Street is all of the utilities below the ground. So the things that you don't see that services all the homes and buildings make it really challenging to actually plant the trees in the first place. But certainly, certainly support more trees. And we do have some plans for for, for more trees in the borough, but there are limitations on doing so in an urban environment. Thanks, Hanesh. We've got lots of questions coming through and only about seven minutes left. So I'll ask if we can just keep them to short responses from now on, just so that we can get through as many as possible. The next question, I'll go to Jürgen and then Roy, I'd love to hear your views as well. So Jürgen, any advice about appointing a provider for a heat pump or a solar panel system any kind of questions that you would recommend that people ask to find um the right supplier and then roy i'll ask you as well if there's anyone any kind of supplies that we would recommend as well yeah again i i can't recommend anyone because that would be a bit biased but but i think there's a lot of information available i mean also through the, through the council i would think that would be the first thing i i, I look and and uh, you know 
speak to people who, who, who walk to walk. I mean, you have the Super Homes Network, for example, where you can pose a question that is run by the National Energy Foundation, that's, that's maybe Super Homes Network. And there, there are others organizations which are basically charitable organizations, which would give you uh, uh, some advice um, uh, and reliable advice. Thanks, Jürgen. Roy, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, pretty much the same as Jürgen, really. We're, we're not really uh, at liberty to sort of uh, recommend a particular installer, but what I can say is the advice, for example, air source heat pumps, it recommends that um, it meets an accreditation standard, uh, which is you know, indicated on our webpage. Uh, and, you know, as long as they are an accredited installer, that is obviously helpful. If they're not accredited, then uh, I'd probably steer away from those. Thanks, Roy. Um, a couple more questions about planning. So I'll stick with you, please, Roy, if that's all right. If planning is required for retrofit, would we consider making those applications free of charge? Uh, <laughs> that's obviously a good wish. Uh, but in practice, uh, as a council, obviously, uh, we try not to charge where we think we can get away with not charging. Uh, and we will only sort of charge where we think it's appropriate. And uh, in terms of pre-apps, we don't charge, uh, and that's where we are allowed to, allow to dictate that. When it comes to formal planning applications, those are um, the rates for planning applications nationally, uh, and there's a fee which, you know, it's, uh, these applications are submitted online generally now, and there's a fee that is required to be submitted as part of the application to make it valid. We don't have any real control over that. Obviously, if, if there was some change in the future, there's different, certainly when it comes to pre-app, we have control over that and what we try to do is we try to encourage people to submit pre-apps to help them avoid any abortive work and also to try and assist and provide useful advice uh, and when it comes to climate change measures retrofit measures that advice from the council is free so that's 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 where we aim to make some change and offer some good deals thanks Roy. there's quite a specific question here about someone's specific house situation and measures so i would recommend um, so that's asking, would you need planning permission for these kinds of measures on this house? Mm -hmm. Please do go through our pre-application service. Um, so we'll share the details of that in the follow-up email, but they will be able to advise on your personal situation. Uh, we won't do that here on the call. But Roy, if someone does need planning permission, how mm -hmm. long would that take to get it? Generally speaking, it's eight weeks. It's a statutory eight-week process to deal with an application. And if we have all the information required to make an assessment, because uh, in terms of process, we normally have to validate an application. We don't have to consult neighbours uh, to give people an opportunity to comment on it. Uh, and then if uh, we do a site visit and then do a planning assessment against the local plan, and that whole sort of process normally takes about eight weeks, including writing a report and uh, making sure it's transparent in the public domain. So eight weeks is a normal process, but it can be anything between once consultation is expired, it could be six weeks onwards. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. This is an open question to any any of our panelists, but there's there's a question from someone which is saying, every time I look into the tech, it can, tin, you know, it's continuing to be evolved. Oh, can't speak this morning. Every time I look into the tech, it's continually evolving. So the thought is to wait until technology stabilizes. Is now the right time to, invest in technology like solar PV or a heat pump, or actually is it worth waiting a few years until things improve? Never, never wait, never wait. <laughs> you, you just have to be cautious in your approach and obviously you have to educate yourself about it. You, have, <clears throat> you can't do it any other way. Uh, you don't want to throw your money away. That, then it's not, no one's going to gain anything from that, you know. But, you know, having having very good LED uh, filament technology, so you look at the color rendering, you don't just look at the cost because otherwise you're going to get head splitting headaches all the time. So you have to be looking at these things in a kind of critical thinking, but the same you apply for everything else on a day-to-day -day basis. And you don't wait. I mean, you don't wait with a mobile phone. Oh, the mobile phone now is, is involved. Will I buy now Nokia? Oh, sorry, I'm not going to advertise, but they're, they're not <laughs> existing anymore anyway. But but what, what sort of phone am I going to buy? You know, it's again the same question because it's, it's ever evolving and that it's great. I mean, you know, the efficiency of solar panels, I bought the first solar panels nearly 30 years ago. They were like 10%. You can't even buy them anymore. You have to go to a museum to get them. I mean, today it's 20% is a box standard. You know, my panels are 10 years old and they've got an efficiency of 18%. You can't get them anymore. 18% is now the box standard. 
efficiency. But the aluminium framing, if I get new solar panels, maybe in 10 years time, I still can use the under frame for the new solar panels, which are much more efficient. So on the 20 square meters, I have instead of a 3.3 kilowatt system, I'm gonna have a four or five kilowatt system. So it's great, you know, it's great. And it goes all gonna go back into the recycling. So it's not, never gonna be wasted as such, you know. Yeah, and I'll just to add to that, for example, uh, Jürgen mentioned uh, solar panels, you know, you now get solar panel tile, roof tiles, which obviously much more expensive, but uh, they're a more recent addition. But you know, if you've got the budget for it, you know, they can be much more efficient and they look better. But again, it, it, it depends partly on budget, but you know, technology doesn't stand still. So in the same way that uh, Jürgen's talking about technology moving on, in terms of planning legislation, we're always almost like trying to catch up. Uh, because so the technology is changing, uh, so but uh, you know, don't stand still is, 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 is the point, don't wait, yeah, uh, it's progress. Thanks, thanks, Roy. Right, well, we'll take about two more minutes, so really quick answers, if that's all right, uh, for everyone. Um, are there, Hanesh, maybe I'll come to you first. What are the alternatives to replace a combi gas boiler? Is it only an air source heat pump? Um. Well, I suppose solar thermal could be a replacement. Uh, air source heat pump is, is probably the most uh, accessible and, and, and best replacement once you've done your energy efficiency measures. Um, and then a ground source heat pump, is, depending on the size of your property and or the size of, of the building. Um, an air source heat pump is probably the most appropriate um, given, yeah, I, I'll probably leave it there because I think we could talk about this for, for for ages, but but yeah, you could consider solar or ground source as well. That's great. Um, then maybe one for Hanesh and Roy. Could uh, the council have a plan for conservation areas to encourage energy efficiency upgrades? For example, solar panels on south facing roofs, even if it's in a conservation area or even if it's visible from the street. So could we encourage things like solar panels in conservation areas and have a scheme to do so? Yes, we could. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to stop, you know, the encouragement of solar panels, it's just about appropriate location and siting. So there is, you know, certain, some solar panels don't actually need consent anyway, but it's really, um, you know, it can be site specific. So I, I would, the simple answer is yes, but uh, yeah, we could leave it there for now. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a wider discussion probably. That's great. I think I will need to wrap us up there. We've got a few more questions in the chat, but I'll make sure that we can get some written answers uh, from Hanesh, Jürgen and Roy and get back to everyone whose answers, uh, whose questions we didn't get to. But thank you so much for the fantastic questions, everyone, and a, a really good and useful discussion there. Just before we wrap up, uh, we never miss an opportunity to promote Climate Connects, which is our newsletter. It's a really nice roundup every month of climate change news and what's happening across the borough. So it talks about what we're doing at the council. It will promote webinars and events like this, it will promote schemes and grants and lots of local projects to get involved in. So the link should be in the chat now. So please do make sure that you're signed up to that. That's the best one-stop shop for any news related to climate and ecology in the borough. But that's all from us and just a huge thank you to Jürgen for taking the time to put the presentation together, share your story today. You know, you're an absolute font of knowledge. So, you know, it's a real delight to be able to have you today um, and very exciting that you're a local resident too. So thank you, Jürgen. Um, yeah. Thanks, Hanesh and Roy, as, as always. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good afternoon. Take care. Okay, bye.